Okay. I imagine you're going to do an eight ball, learn more about dirty. Okay. <laughs> It is just sounds like we're live. We're good. Anytime, any. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, be respectful of everyone's time, and we do have a quorum, so that's that's good. So let me go ahead and open this meeting of the El Paso County Public Health Board of Health, and uh, this meeting is is being live streamed, so we have a, a virtual audience as well. And the first thing that we do is do a board member roll car. Well, so I'm here. Commissioner Bremer? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Council Member Donaldson, we'll probably see you shortly. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, good. Dr. Vu? I'm here. Fire Chief Ted Colas? Here. Ms. Doris Ralston? Here. And um, Trustee Bronson? Here. Great. Good. Um, let me go ahead and just uh, begin by introducing our newest member of the Board of Health, who is Trustee Ron Stevens. He was appointed by the Board of County Commissioners last week to fill the seat previously assigned uh, to a representative uh, from Fountain. That was um, Sam Gibbs. And uh, so, um, Ron, you want to share a little bit? Well, about yourself with the with the group. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, as I as he said, my name is Ron Stevens. I'm a trustee from the town of Monument. I lived in Monument for 22 years now, and I've been on the board of trustees for about one almost one term. So I'm completing my one term and uh, be uh, hopefully reelected the next time around. So shouldn't be a uh, that should be fine. Uh, my background, unfortunately, is not as strong in the health area. I've been working in the IT world, so I'm a software consultant uh, is what I do for, uh, for my day job, if you will. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I'm just grateful to meet everybody. I'm grateful to learn, and, uh, and uh, it's, I think it's a great opportunity to be here. So thank you for everyone who uh, is, is the county commissioners that appointed me and all the people I've met even today you've been very nice and I appreciate uh, working with you and I look forward to it they are a nice bunch thank you all right John. welcome aboard um, first action item is approval of the agenda and board members you have that in front of you uh, I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve so moved second second all in favor Aye. 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 So number three, Board of Health comments. We have a little housekeeping to do, and it turns out that the Air Force Academy graduation uh, is the th same time as our next uh, board meeting. So I need to know probably by sh show of hands. Uh, I guess we'll ask it this way. Who will be able to attend our next uh, meeting on May 25th? And if we don't have a quorum, we'll... we'll perhaps reschedule it. So those who attend, okay? Sammy, you'll be gone. One, two, three, you're gonna go? Four, okay? And we'll wait until Council Member Donaldson gets here. I could, I, I, I could probably be here for the first hour, but. Could you? But okay. I well, it's an important, I mean, yeah. Major units, you know, okay. At this point, let's go ahead and, and keep it on the schedule as uh, as planned. If we need to do a call on audible sometime in the next month, we'll do that. But right now, the next board meeting on May 25th stands. Um, I'll go ahead and lead off. I've got a couple of things here. One is I had an opportunity to attend the, the uh, Fentanyl uh, Town Hall, as I think a number of others, and... Uh, how many superlatives can I use? It was, it was great, and there was a panel up front of very knowledgeable and experienced and um, significant panelists. So that continues to be a really high agenda item for this uh, board. It's obvious that for the county, it's a high agenda, uh, a highly important agenda item, and uh, also for the Gazette. 
and I, you know, the Gazette has had a series of what I think are excellent articles about fentanyl. Uh, so I had a, a chance to talk with the uh, uh, the editor after the meeting as well. So, uh, Dr. Urbina, I think you're going to be addressing this later on fentanyl again. We'll get an update on that. But just so you, so you know that uh, fentanyl continues to be a real important item for our our Board of Health. Okay, so this is the part that is uh, is sad, is that we're going to be saying farewell to, to Kari Kilroy. And I have some, some remarks here, but also some personal remarks to, to make. Let me just to recount. Uh, uh, Kari Kilroy's second term ended on April 1st, and so she's here today so we can recognize her for her service to the El Paso County Board of Health for 10 years. And Kari was first appointed to the Board of Health in April of 2012. She served as president for five years from 2014 to 2018. During her time as president, she chaired 52 board meetings and six board retreats, and over 60 resolutions and proclamations were passed during her presidential tenure. She was also president during the appointment of two public health directors, including our current director, Susan Whelan. Uh, Kari's in the back. Should we, we get her up? up please? Come, Kari, yes. Kari, come on. I told you I was going to embarrass you. I gave you fair warning. Through her entire tenure on the board, she has been a part of many efforts, including the integration of El Paso County Public Health um, into the El Paso County Services in early 2013, the accreditation of our health department through the Public Health Accreditation Board, and reaccreditation in 2020. And um, note that our health department was the first accredited and reaccredited in um, the state of Colorado. Uh, she presided over the establishment of the Southeast WIC Clinic, which brought WIC services to a much needed area of the county, and the procurement of Public Health South in 2020, which again expanded our services, including COVID 19 testing and vaccines. Uh, so, in addition to that, I did a little research <laughs> and <laughs> no. came up with that uh, uh, Corey is assistant to the CEO and board of directors at UC Memorial with more than 25 years of nonprofit and public sector experience. Corey has served on uh, many other community organizations, including the El Paso County Citizen Budget Oversight Committee and the City of Manitou Springs Parking Authority. She was chair of the Communications Committee for the Association of Healthcare Administrative Professionals, which publishes an award-winning newsletter. Kari has a bachelor's degree in philosophy from UCPS and a master's degree in health communication from Emerson College Tufts University of Medicine in Boston. She is also a graduate of the UCPS College of Business Leadership Development for emerging healthcare leaders. And personally, what I wanted to say is that you have been a very strong voice for public health and a great partner and a faithful friend to me. And I learned a great deal from you, and I was not kidding when I said that you have been my mentor. So thank you. And a couple of things specifically that I learned from you along the way were to always try and stay abreast of health issues of all types in El Paso County and what you have done. And secondly, be in frequent contact and support of our public health director. Um, lastly, I wanted to remind everyone that Kari was our representative from the nonprofit charitable organizations sector. That was her seat on the board and a job which she has done remarkably well. So Kari, thanks for being such a big help to me personally for your service to our board of health for the past 10 years and such a strong advocate for our community. Thank you. Thank you. We will miss you. Other comments from board members or for Corey? I just echo point? that. It's just been amazing. Um, you're inspiring, and you give me courage, and, and I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Susan, yes, please. Any other board members? Uh, I wanted to thank you for all your years of service, uh, and particularly that that uh, outreach into the southeast was greatly needed. Uh, the WIC Center and the South uh, facilities were things that are very important that are going to continue 
to, to, uh, to assist uh, our entire community, and so I appreciate all that. Thank you. Director Whelan? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Harry, I have really enjoyed serving on this board with you, too. I'm, I'm a little sad that it couldn't overlap a little longer um, because I think um, it's very clear to see that you're, you're driven um, by what you think is right, um, and you're not afraid to voice that. And regardless of whether there are agreements or disagreements over that at time at times it is um, it's it's a great thing to be surrounded by board members who really care passionately and that's very very clear um, and uh, I do wish I had a little bit longer to work on this board with you um, and I think this this April 1st um, end of term kind of snuck up on all of us. Um, I thought we had a little bit longer. What I will also say is that, you know, as Dr. Turbush read your um, accomplishments and bio and how long you've been on this board, um, it, it was easy during the pandemic to, to get um, swept up into um, kind of dealing with, with what was next and what was right in front of us. But I feel like your leadership heading into um, the last two years really set Susan and her team up for some success and some stability um, and the programs that we did have particularly in the southeast and and with women and children and people who really needed a lot more support during the pandemic um, you were instrumental in making sure that we were set up uh, set up for that um, and I just I appreciate it and these these are incredibly sincere comments and I look forward to Continuing to get to know you better outside of this. Good. Record. Okay, Kari, mine are going to be short. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for um, your service to the community and thank you for being a part of this team and for giving me an example. I appreciate it. Kari, I just hope to have a glass of wine with you and Joel at some point. <laughs> Good places. Good. Any other uh, Board of Health member comment? Uh, we're saying farewell to Kari Kilroy after 10 years. And uh, Director Whelan. I want to make sure this is working. Um, so I, I've been with uh, public health here over 20 years, and so I um, have had the opportunity to work uh, closely with Kari um, for uh, a decade. And I am going to miss you. Um, I, you know, echo everything that Dr. Turbush had, had said and, and um, uh, Commissioner Bremer as well. You have a, a long list of uh, accomplishments and you have such a um, background with so much expertise that has benefited local public health and supported local public health. I look forward to continuing working with you um, clinical, hospital, and public health is a uh, symbiotic um, relationship, and that's really where um, we can excel with uh, community health improvements. But I did want to take the opportunity on behalf of the entire staff um, to thank you, and really a heartfelt thank you, because a couple of things that, you know, o over the years, um, it's great to have accomplishments, it's a great to have expertise, and um, produce results. Um, ultimately, we're a business, and and we need to uh, produce results for the community and and be um, uh, prudent with with taxpayer dollars and the funding that we get. But one thing that stands out to me, especially over the past couple of years, um, I, I knew this prior to the pandemic, but even more so, how you treat people and how you show care and compassion. Um, to others around you, um, and not, that doesn't mean that we're always going to agree on everything, and that's okay. Um, I think it makes for better decisions um, when we uh, push each other respectfully um, for the community's benefit and also for um, our growth benefit as well. But I just wanted to say um, on behalf of the, the staff, thank you, because every year you show compassion and care. Um, you know, some of the things that, you know, people may not know, um, Kari always sends a big Christmas um, gift, and and we put it in the the break room, and and some you know get it, and some don't. Maybe some are here, some on vacation, but some might lose out. But it's a it's a huge uh, edible arrangements 
and um, that that is always something that <laughs> we know we can count on, and um, it's it's delicious as well. Um, so so thank you for that. And then on the business side also is that you know since I you know started my career here at local public health in 1999, we had suffered um, budget cuts every single year, significant. And Kari's um, advocacy to um, you know, write a letter or to show up or make phone calls or, you know, whatever is needed. You know, sometimes it takes years of work to the funding to come to fruition. And Kari has always um, been steady focused on that a population our size, 500,000 to almost a million, um, we're about 100 short FTE. And she's never lost sight of that focus and always willing to help out. Um, and, and that really stands out to me because when Commissioner Bremer talks about preparing us for what is coming um, in, in the pandemic, you absolutely helped um, our agency and our staffing be stronger. Um, you know, our, our county commissioners um, um, uh, approved, you know, additional 10 FTE before the pandemic and, and funding and, and, you know, and all of this works together. And, and also at the state level, um, we received three years of increased state per capita, um, and it had been flat for a decade. <laughs> and so all of your efforts, you know, writing letters, phone calls, connections, um, it, it is truly um, something that you can feel really proud about because you have had a great impact that will last. Um, and so thank you so much. Um, we. We, there's only a few here in the audience, but our entire staff, um, we, we uh, greatly appreciate you. And I also see another, um, one of my team members would probably like to say something, or you have the, the coin, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll just support you too. Any other thank yous for Kari? Okay, here's your chance, and then we have a photo op to follow. Hang on, hang on. We're yeah. I turn it off. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> um, I looked back at all the agendas, and you, you listed most of the things that, you know, I just was looking back and reflecting. Um, so I'm going to skip all of that that I was going to talk about. And I just uh, humbled, and I'm grateful to have been part of this organization for so long. It's, uh, it's a decade. It's been like a lifetime. Um, but, I, but as I leave... I'm actually, I would like to encourage the board to please keep focus on at least two things. And I know you'll have many things that you'll have to focus on, but I think the first thing and arguably the most important is that by state statute, this board is um, tasked with hiring a public health director. And that is probably the best thing that I ever did is hiring Susan Whelan. Um, she has proved to be one of the best things we ever did. And she is creating a capable and stellar team. So I would, I would just say, please keep your focus on that. Hopefully you will not have to hire any other public health directors, but um, let Susan and her team do what they do best because uh, we, we hired an excellent person and she has led this uh, department through some insane things, starting with the Waldo Canyon fire up until this COVID pandemic. Um, and then the second thing, and that was sort of mentioned, is I'd, I'd hope that you please continue working with the BOCC and perhaps engage city council um, to increase public health staffing. Um, it's, it's well documented that the number of staff here have not kept up with the county's steady climb in, in population. Um, and this has been, as Susan mentioned, an ongoing concern. Um, a previous public health director in 2017 was asked what kept him up at night, and the thing that kept him up at night was he said a large-scale outbreak that the staff are well trained but there aren't enough of them so 
those are this is what I would like to leave you with, um, please, <laughs> is just to keep your your eyes on those two things as you continue forward. And um, I know I'm leaving things in very capable hands, um, and I am humbled again and grateful to have been part of this and thoroughly embarrassed by all of this because it's it's a team. It's you know not me at all. It's a team, the board and the staff really. So thank you, and this means the world to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> oh, don't, don't leave yet. Michelle, you, you're going to organize this part? Yes, okay. <laughs> we got a photo op. Here oh, we go. I almost got out. <laughs> <laughs> you can't escape. Okay. Michelle's going to organize this. Don't worry. How do you want to do it? There's seven. I know one of them is uh, first. <laughs> Why don't we just stand? Is that what you think? Yeah. Okay. okay. Here we go. Our How many is it? Uh, four years? Four years. Four years. Yeah, he did. Uh, I think it's a good one.
Okay, well, um, I think we have another award, but before we do that, let's go ahead and finish Board of Health member um, comments, that, that section. So we'll kind of go around the room here, Dr. Boo. No comments, please. Okay, Commissioner Brimmer. Um, this may be um, in a staff report later, but I just wanted to remind people um, of the DEA Take Back Day, which is Saturday, um, Saturday the 30th from 10 to 2. You can go to um, www.deatakeback.com and put in your zip code and find a location nearest to you. And we have, I think, about eight locations spread across El Paso County, north, south, east, west, um, and uh, I would just encourage you to get rid of those um, those prescription bottles that are um, expired or unused um, in your cabinet, and this is a safe way to do that. Good. Welcome. I would just like to welcome Trustee Stevens. I know you will find your experience <coughs> really rewarding as, as testimony of um, Kari Kilroy, and um, we welcome you and um, look forward to your contribution to the Board of Health and our community. Uh, thank you. I, I too wanted to welcome you to the uh, board. Uh, I did want to highlight uh, one issue that uh, came out a little bit, and I put it on our weekly article, at, I think, today, uh, for the Fountain Valley with the uh, PFAS uh, issues. Uh, we've been doing really good with the water uh, purification, uh, working with the Department of Defense. Uh, the state, so CDPHE had done some uh, studies on a couple of three ponds in the state. Uh, so one of them was Willow Springs Ponds, which makes sense because we have the uh, Peterson Space Force Base there uh, issue. And uh, so they did identify some elevated levels in the pond as well as in the concentration of fish. So out of uh, just a, a abundance of uh, precaution, uh, we do, do have some signs out there now uh, uh, mentioning, uh, you know, consumption concerns about any fish. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, health concerns uh, specifically. Uh, for the site, but uh, because of that, the state will not be stocking pond, uh, stocking fish in there uh, until there's some mitigation. I have specifically uh, started working with our congressional delegation, our uh, state uh, delegation, as well as the uh, CDPHE, and emailed the governor asking uh, for support in requesting funding and mitigation efforts uh, uh, to help our community down there on that separate issue. So again, that report just came out in March, so it was a recent update. Uh, and so, of course, uh, our local uh, public health and uh, working with the state and our parks department have been uh, working uh, uh, to make sure that we are taking care of our residents. Thank you. Our Chief Copes. No? Okay. Going to Mr. Donaldson. It's been on the whole time. Uh, thank you, President Turbush. <clears throat> I would just like to uh, inform the other members of the board and, and everyone else sitting here and listening that yesterday Colorado Springs City Council passed an ordinance which will uh, really assist our CSPD and our um, city attorney's office in shutting down the illicit massage parlors in Colorado Springs. We vote on, on it again in uh, two weeks. It really will, they'll, they'll start enforcing it the 1st of September. And we believe there are approximately 30 illicit massage parlors in Colorado Springs right now. It's extremely difficult for PD to shut down even one. They have to do a big investigation and then it pops right back up. The way the ordinance is written, and I kind of spearheaded this, but it was really the work of our attorneys and PD and our clerk's office. Uh, they will have to be licensed now. Um, physical therapy um, physical therapy uh, businesses will have to have a license. So it's a way PD can go in and quickly shut these things down. Um, and you never know. Maybe in the public health setting, we're going to decrease uh, the STD rate here in, in Colorado Springs, right? So uh, it's a really good thing. Uh, it's a good day for uh, Colorado Springs. Thanks. Thank you. Christy. Yes, I just want to, again, thank everybody <laughs> for your warm greetings and welcoming being so welcoming today. Thank you. And other elected officials, officials. I think we have Colorado Springs City Council President Tom Strand. Any comments for us, sir? Oh, sir, thank you very okay. much. Okay. Watch and appreciate all your work. Thank you. Glad you're here. Any other elected officials? No? Okay. I think we have another award. And so let me start that out. We'd like to recognize Lieutenant Cheryl Peck 
from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office as she is returning this Friday. Lieutenant Peck has been with the Sheriff's Office for 39 years and 43 if you count her cadet time and has most recently overseen county security. She has been a tremendous partner to our public health agency by providing security and dedicated coordination to our Board of Health meetings and also assisting us with security needs at our COVID-19 vaccine points of dispensing when we were unable to obtain private security services. We greatly appreciate the support that she's provided to us over the years and though we are sorry to see her go, we wish her the very best in her upcoming retirement. So thanks again from the Board of Health for all your all your great work and for being there for us and, and, and keeping us safe. Thank you. Thank you. Other other Board of Health member comments? I'll jump in here. Um, as a county commissioner, we have the opportunity to work, work a lot directly with you um, and with your staff. And it's just the professionalism um, and the... Uh, the commitment to serving everybody, um, the citizens and the elected officials, um, taking very seriously the protection of all of us. Um, it's impressive. Um, you know, I think we have uh, uh, Ms. Peck to thank um, for a smooth transition to this uh, more open and publicly accessible space. Um, thank you for kind of a last minute switch uh, that really, um, that, that you and your team and the rest of the public health team did a great job in making sure that, that we can um, strike that balance of having everyone, um, public, public members and board members, uh, be safe in one space um, and open and accessible. Um, that just means a lot that we have um, somebody in security and at the head of security who understands that that's that's a that's a balance um and it's one that takes um it takes just a commitment to to each person as an individual and that shines through every bit of your work i am also very sad to see you go um and like i said we have the opportunity to interact with you and your staff on a daily basis um and it's it's just impressive the team that you've built there and um, i hope retirement treats you well i'd love to hear a little bit about plans for retirement if she's up for it yeah yeah any other comments oh, it's, oh i just want to thank you for all your service i didn't know are we allowed to reject her her retirement as a as a you might, as you board might, as a county commissioners a yeah. county commissioners we might be able to reject that yeah. and and, and uh, my favorite story of course is that one time you guys had to you guys had to license my my hands as lethal weapons. That's Remember right. that for security purposes. You know, right. So, uh, so. Now there's but, a story. No, yeah. I, it's, but no, I just appreciate all the great work you've done for us uh, here and and with the commissioners. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And uh, on behalf of City Council, I also want to thank you for your service to the uh, to El Paso County and, and the City of Colorado Springs. We truly appreciate it. Director Wheeling. Cheryl, we're, we're sad to see you go as well. Yeah. Um, on behalf of our entire team, um, just want to extend a, a heartfelt thank you as well because um, you've you've always uh, um, been so responsive. It you know didn't matter when we needed to flex and change plans, whether that was to Centennial Hall and you know organizing all of the um, logistics and and to ensure our safety. And and we greatly appreciate that. And I also want to say. Um, you know, there are things that are visible to the public and there are not as it relates to our team safety. And um, Cheryl has really worked to enhance that. And it's made us feel safer also, not only within, um, you know, this building, but um, just, just throughout some many different dynamics. And so we really appreciate your efforts. And, um, you know, we wish you well on the next phase and in your retirement. And if you could um, maybe refresh... Um, us on like who's your backup here what's um he's actually right there yeah if, if we could do so uh this is oh uh, okay i met chris, him the other day this is lieutenant chris rogers and okay. he'll be the my replacement so. okay okay well welcome yeah he'll do, he'll do a good job for you guys yeah well lieutenant peck do you want to give us a couple of uh sentences about what you plan to do now with your retirement or um any other sure. comments i um so <laughs> I, I appreciate all the support that you guys have given us. Um, I really appreciate, sorry, it's all emotional for me. Um, I really appreciate Susan, um, Deanna, um, all the, the partnership that you guys gave us and getting to know you guys. 
um, Dr. Commissioners, uh, all of you guys. Uh, it's been a, a real pleasure working with um, this group of people. Um, and then all the struggles that went on during the last couple of years of the COVID really threw a curveball for everybody and uh, gave us a lot of increased challenges, but we were able to get through those and everything worked out good. And uh, so I really appreciate all the support that you guys have given me personally and given our team. And I appreciate your friendship. Well, thank you. Good. Uh-oh. There we go. You've got another coin. You know there's an obligation that comes with that coin. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. All of you for later. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Great. Is there a, a photo op? Okay. I'm not sure if you're Chris, you're going to have to I, 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 I <laughs> oh, no, I said, well, no, they could have no, licensed them because then this would be for carry, you know, and so you can't. I, you know, I just make I just made something up. <laughs> That's but I thought it was good. <laughs> it was good. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, we have a pretty busy agenda today, so let's go to the next uh, item. Do we have any public comment on items that are not scheduled on the agenda? Anyone here who wants to speak on items not on the agenda? And how about virtually? Have we got anybody? Nope. Okay, all right. Next action item is approval of minutes. You have the minutes of the last meeting in front of you, Board of Health members. Any comments? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve. We did. Didn't we do the agenda right here? We did. We got that one. But thanks for keeping me on track. Uh, move, move to approve. OK. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next item is finance and budget, and uh, Samantha's here, and I think we have something we can put up on the screen. And while we're doing that, let me just read a note here. It says, regarding the removal of action required from this particular agenda item, our legal counsel and county finance discussed this, and they are not aware of any statute or local rule requiring approval of monthly financial reports. The Board of County Commissioners does not do this, but it does appear that the Board of Health always has. The statutes only require approval of the original adopted budget and any amendments. Therefore, this action item has been removed from the agenda. We don't need a formal vote on that, but we get to hear from you again each, each month. So please go ahead and give your report. Uh, up is on. Yeah, no, up is on. Okay. Uh, good morning, Board of Health. Samantha Montmany, Budget Supervisor, mm -hmm. Health and Human Services. Um, in your packet, you guys have the report for our March financial records. Um, as of right now, we're looking at revenues about $6.4 million and expenditures about $5.1. Um, overall, everything is coming in slightly under budget. But again, expenditures are lower than revenues. So at this time, we have no concerns. Any questions? Board members, you have the numbers in front of you. Any questions for Samantha while we're here? Any other comments? Okay. Okay, I think we're good. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Okay, next is new business, and we have some action required items, uh, one of which is a resolution to update the 2022 regular meeting schedule location. And I have those right here. Now, a little explaining to do on this first one. Um, this first one is merely to modify for public benefit that we are going to meet in the new location, this location. I think it's working out rather well. So I'm going to read that uh, uh, part of it. Whereas pursuant to Section 251508, the El Paso County Board of Health is required to meet in regular session at least every three months, as may be established by resolution of the Board of Health. And whereas the Board of Health established its regular meeting schedule for calendar year 2022 on December 15th of 2021 by resolution, and whereas the Board of Health wishes to establish a new location for its regular meetings to accommodate more attendees and make accessibility easier for guests and members of the public, as noted at the last regular meeting on March 23rd. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Board of Health that the El Paso County Board of Health shall conduct the remainder of its regular meetings during the calendar year 2022 in rooms 1017 or 1019 on the first floor of the Citizen Service Center, 1575 Garden of God's Road, Colorado Springs, unless otherwise announced. And then there's a listing of the meeting dates, which have not changed. Special meetings of the Board of Health will be scheduled as necessary. And all Board of Health work sessions, public hearings, regular meetings, and special meetings are open to the public. So, board members, any discussion on that item? Okay, I'd entertain a motion to approve. I move the uh, adoption of this resolution. Second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we have one more. And this is a particularly fun one. Uh, proclamation of the El Paso County Board of Health recognizing National Nurses Week 2022. I'm, I'm particularly partial to nurses. I'm married to one. And uh, let's begin. Whereas National Nurses Week is celebrated each year between May 6th National Nurses Day, and May 12th, the birthday of celebrated nurse Florence Nightingale. And whereas the National Nurses Week honors the contributions and sacrifices of nurses and serves as a reminder to thank the medical professionals who keep individuals and communities healthy, and whereas nurses are extraordinary individuals who display courage, care, dedication, and commitment in caring for others, and whereas the American Public Health Association defines public health nursing as the practice of promoting and protecting the health of populations using knowledge from nursing, social, and public health sciences, and whereas public health nurses work to promote wellness and help prevent disease and reduce health risks at the population level through evidence-based care and education, and whereas public health nurses serve in many critical roles, the, and El Paso County public health nurses serve individuals and families across numerous programs and services, including nurse family partnership, immunizations and travel, tuberculosis, disease prevention, reproductive health, and much more. Whereas the knowledge and skills of public health nurses enable them to make significant contributions to the public health through a unique combination of clinical nursing background with knowledge from the public health and social sciences. And whereas it is more important than ever to celebrate nurses across all fields for their unwavering care and dedication for their patients and communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Board of Health, the week of May 6th through May 12th is proclaimed National Nurses Week in El Paso County, Colorado. Any, any comments? Yes. I have some after board members. Okay. Board member? Comments? Okay, Director Whelan. Okay. Um, I would like um, a Car uh, Cara Hamby, who is the program manager of Nurse Family Partnership, to come up with your team. Christy Durbin, program manager of Immunizations and Travel Clinic, with your team. Eric Gordon, who is our lead disease prevention nurse, 
with tuberculosis prevention and Summer South um, program manager with our family planning um, clinic. And I would also like uh, Deanne Ryberg, and maybe she stepped mm -hmm. out. Where's Deanne? Okay, I will um, <laughs> hold, hold my comments when <coughs> she comes back in. Um, uh, Kara, if, if you can come up with your team and um, introduce your team with News, Nurse Family Partnership, who is, who's here? Are they? Okay. Hi, my name is Kara Hamby. I am the program manager for the Nurse Family Partnership Program, and I have most of my nurses here today. We have Rowan Hall and Samara Pittman and Marie Chapman, Stephanie Dodson and Sarah Elliott and Elizabeth Anderson. Um, um, on behalf of the Nurse Family Partnership team, we'd like to thank Dr. Turbish, the Board of Health, and El Paso County Public Health Leadership um, for this opportunity to recognize the nurses and all the hard work that they have completed, not just over the pandemic, but in their entire careers. Um, we um, have tirelessly worked to ensure that this community has continued to receive adequate and appropriate nursing services. Um, our team has worked innovatively and creatively to make sure that um, the moms and babies that we work with um, get telehealth services, which is not as amazing as when we can see them in person, but they have done it and done it really well. So thank you for this opportunity, um, and thank you for my team for all that they've done. Great. Thank, thank you, Kara, and uh, congratulations that, that we're uh, recognizing you all, and we thank you for your hard work, and we'll, we'll bring you back up for a photo as well. How about <laughs> Kirsty Durbin, who is the program manager with our immunizations and, and travel clinic, and um, she also, uh, you know, served in um, putting together all of the logistics with emergency preparedness at all of the different vaccination clinics and ordering all of the vaccine supplies for our community and coordinating that um, as well. If you want to um, introduce yourself and also your, your team members. Sure. Um, my name is Christy Durbin, um, as Susan said, and I have part of my immunization team um, with me today. So I have um, Care, uh, Carrie, who uh, is the assistant immunization program manager, and Laura, who is one of our newest um, immunization nurses. So um, I just want to thank uh, Susan, Deanne, and Brenda for your incredible leadership over the last couple of years. Um, to say that it's been challenging would be an incredible understatement, and I'm so grateful that we could look to you um, during that really challenging time. Um, these nurses, it's just a portion of my nurses, um, they work to protect our community every single day, whether that's vaccinating kids and adults um, with their routine vaccines, giving them COVID vaccines um, to protect us, and also working out in the field at mobile vaccine pods. They're really the boots on the ground um, protecting our community. So um, thank you all for your support, and thank you for this recognition. Thank you, Kirsty. And we'll, we'll call you back up um, uh, a little bit later as well. But I did want to note we have, since we have... Uh, um, uh, Tom Strand, president of city council, and also uh, Dave Donaldson. Um, we've, we've put this out there, but uh, uh, Kirsty Durbin, our program manager with the Immunization Clinic, was recognized um, by Mayor Southers um, for, for leadership, and, and she was part of a, um, a group, and that, that was within the last um, few months. So I think that that is, is very significant, that we've got such um, incredible um, team members here and, and expertise. And next, let's uh, have Eric Gordon come up. And Eric, if you um, would like to introduce yourself, and um, doesn't look like you have anyone else from TB here. Just myself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Uh, so my name is Eric Gordon. I'm the lead disease prevention nurse, uh, primarily working in tuberculosis and communicable disease. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank the board uh, for taking the time to recognize uh, National Nurses Week. So thank you all. I'd like, I'd like to also recognize the many nurses that I have the privilege here to stand up with uh, and also work with both uh, in the past and the present. I think we've seen over the last two years of this pandemic that nurses play a vital role in our community in obvious settings such as hospitals, clinics, and emergency rooms, but also here in public health agencies where nurses have been involved, as we've heard about, in all aspects of the pandemic response, uh, and that can range from holding mobile clinics to provide vaccines, contact tracing in businesses, uh, as well as identifying new cases of COVID in our community. Um, 
All the while, there's also other nursing staff who are busy supporting and developing their staff uh, who are often doing their, you know, quote unquote, regular jobs while incorporating new responsibilities related to the pandemic. Uh, even beyond that, I think nurses play an important role that might often uh, not be visible to the public, often working behind the scenes, uh, such as the cases, the nurses that I work with uh, right now, both inside and outside of this agency, who are involved in providing medical care, case management, and resettlement services to incoming refugees, uh, in particular from Afghanistan, as we welcome these folks into our community. So again, thank you to all the nurses that I work with. Uh, I have a pleasure working with you, and also to the board for this recognition. It's appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I have uh, two more. Summer South with our family planning clinic, if you can come up and if you have any other team members here. Hi, my name is Summer South. I am the family planning program manager here at El Paso County Public Health. Um, I just started into this position last year, May, so I got to jump right into the hot seat. Um, and I don't have any team members here with me today because they are upstairs serving clients, um, doing what they do best. I have two nurse practitioners that work with me in the clinic. Um, I just want to thank all of you here today, um, Board of Health, County Commissioners, El Paso County leadership. Um, this has been a phenomenal opportunity for me to continue to serve uh, the community in the way that I've always wanted to as a nurse, uh, to be recognized and honored for that. Um, it's humbling um, and so very unnecessary, but very much appreciated. Um, but, you know, jumping into the management role um, has been nothing compared to what our staff has dealt with over these last few years. Um, I came into this in during a time of transition from being partially telehealth services um, and part-time in clinic and then fully pivoting into full-time services. Um, they took it in stride. My team is phenomenal. Um, the camaraderie and, you know, especially I share a clinic with uh, immunizations and just working alongside all of these incredibly dedicated professionals um, it has just been an honor. I am so excited to be here. I plan to be here for a very long time. Um, and to continue to serve the public. So thank you very much. Thank you, Summer. Appreciate it. And last but not least, um, Laura Stern with our Maternal Child Health Program. If you could come up and introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. My name is Larry, I'm a nurse care coordinator lead with our HCP team. I brought a few notes to say because I'm a good nurse, not so much public speaker. <laughs> so thank you for recognizing the work and dedication of the nurses at El Paso County Public Health through this proclamation acknowledging National Nurses Week. The role we play in nursing is very different than what we probably had envisioned. However, I consider being a public health nurse a great honor and privilege. I place high value on the work that I do within our community and the direct influence that I have on the health and well-being of children and families. I am working with some of the most vulnerable in our community and provide education, tools, resources to improve health outcomes. I am grateful to work for an agency that values citizens, promotes equity, prioritizes prevention, and appreciates health. Thank you again for this very special recognition. Thank you, Laura. And I'd like um, our Deputy Director, Deanne Ryberg, to come up, please. So I think many of you might know or, or may, may not, but Deanne is a um, public health nurse. And I think that um, it's, it's incredible. Um, it's an incredible benefit to our agency to have a deputy director um, who is a uh, public health nurse, um, understands uh, science and, and clinical, and, and also has a master's in public health as well, um, which our agency is, is largely about um, population health, but but we do um, some clinical as well, and it's a symbiotic uh, relationship, as I was saying earlier when Kari was up here. And so I want to emphasize how much, um, you know, our nurses, public health nurses, are heroes. Um, I don't think that, that they get enough recognition. Um, as Eric said, um, a lot of times, I mean, they are behind the scenes, and they are out there preventing illness and disease, addressing health equity issues, um, and they are improving overall community health. And so on behalf of the, the board and, and our entire team, you guys are highly valued. 
Um, and, you know, I am so happy to actually see you <laughs> because I've missed you. Um, and as, as we're transitioning back into, um, you know, many programs that, that were not clinical, that, you know, we are telehealth and, and um, you know, being innovative about how we approach our, our work, um, know that your leadership team um, appreciates uh, tremendously the work that you do. And, you know, sometimes we might not get the chance to say it, but these past couple of years and your adaptability and your flexibility and the leadership that you've shown um, does not go unrecognized. So we want to celebrate you and, and we need to do it more often. So um, thank you so much. And if Deanne wanted to, to say something, that's those are my comments for this uh, recognition week. Thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you, Board of Health members, for recognizing our public health nurses and the important role that they play in our agency. And I just have to say, I'm so glad that my career path took me to public health because what a wonderful opportunity to mix um, a desire to serve, a desire to help people with science and to have the opportunity to serve the community that we live in. And I'm so grateful for that. And also the unique opportunities that public health nursing affords all of us. I've been, had the opportunity to respond to Hurricane Katrina as a public health nurse. I've had the opportunity to um, be part of our response for the last two years. And those moments of serving a community in crisis, it's, it's a privilege to be part of that. And I thank the board for the recognition this morning. I thank my nurse colleagues at the agency for all of their incredible work and always striving for clinical excellence and service to the community. Thank you. Any other board member comments about, any comments from the public about nurses? I have one quick comment. The very first thing I learned as a, a, an intern, as a new physician, is be nice to them. <laughs> because they can be nice to you and make your life a lot better. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Photo op? Yep. Okay. I think we should stand up and give a Yes. out of the way okay <laughs> no, I know. It just right. feels good over here. <laughs> All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and take a few photos. Okay, that was nice. Um, we have a uh, very full director's report today. Did you approve that one, Mayor? I don't think we voted on that proclamation, did we? We didn't. didn't. You're I don't know if we actually keeping me. We read it. So you moved it. Okay. You need a second. Need a second on that? I enthusiastically second that. Okay, all in favor? 
Aye. 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 That was enthusiastic as well. Okay. <laughs> National Nurses Week. Now we can move on to director's report. Two parts. First, an update on um, uh, fentanyl, and and then our um, COVID update. Okay. So, Director Whelan, you want to go ahead and run this one? Sure. I I want to back up just a little bit and and recognize. Um, an award that, that we received, if we have that slide. The Government Finance Off Officers Association Award. Um, today is bringing back some memories. So as we transitioned to integrate with uh, the county back in 2013, um, that we uh, um, have finance support, HR support, and um, information technology, um, we have consistently received some outstanding awards and it's um, because of the, the leadership and the expertise of the county finance um, department. And it's Nikki Simmons, who is now the, I don't know what her title is, but the chief finance officer for the county that she was promoted yes, um, to. But she also supported us uh, many years before that. And then we also have um, Samantha uh, Montgomery, which you know was here earlier giving our, our report, Debbie Perry. Um, there's there's many in in the county that help support us, and then also this this award goes to um, the uh, um, our leadership team as well as the program managers and anyone that oversees a budget because this is teamwork and um, this is significant because public health departments don't receive these types of awards, and I think that this um, is is worth uh, noting uh, the excellence uh, which is part of our our values and. Um, that we received this this award, so wanted to to make sure that that you all had that on your your radar. And this is a, a rigorous type of uh, um, you know process that um, to, to receive this award. So this agency and, and, and county um, excels in, in the the finance areas and the reporting. And and um, I think that that's that's just something that that is noteworthy. Now we'll jump into <laughs> some other um, topics. We have, um, you know, we there was a a panel discussion last week held at Centennial Hall, and um, we were invited to it, but it got too big to be too big of a panel. Um, however, we were um, we did have a presence, and Dr. Urbina, our medical director, um, was there in case we we needed to to answer any questions. But UC Health and Dr. Leon Kelly also um, handled much of the. Um, the medical, medical and, and, and public health questions. We have a special guest here today to join uh, Dr. Urbina um, Corey, and, and so happy to see you back there. He is um, with uh, the D11, District 11 School District, and he's a, a friend to local public health because he has been with us all throughout the process of um, building our, our work group for teen suicide, and, and now he is helping us um, specific to the youth population and um, awareness around fentanyl and, and um, opioids as well. So we do have a presentation um, for you on this, and then we also have our um, Community Health Promotion Division Director because there's so many different aspects that, that I think are important to, to keep on our radar when it comes to the opioid and fentanyl um, crisis. So Heather Graves is here too. So Dr. Urbina, do you want to start us off? Thank you, Susan. Uh, glad to be here. Can you hear me okay? I usually make a, my terrible joke about muttering into the phone. I won't do that today. Uh, I'm starting off this presentation, but I think as, as uh, Susan mentioned, we have Corey here, who is a member of our community and our school districts, as well as uh, Heather, who will talk about our community services. But I think all of you who went to the community forum uh, should recognize that we have a tremendous amount of resources and colleagues and partners here in our community that can really make a difference. We all recognize this is a very complex problem, that it's going to take a, not necessarily a village, but a broad community support, not only from our safety folks, from our treatment folks, from our providers in our community, but our school districts, our nonprofits, our medically assisted treatment, our partners in mental health, as well as public health. And I just wanted to highlight some of those strategies that we talked about. 
Uh, we've had this community forum. I think we're beginning the dialogue. We have good media coverage of it. As you mentioned, uh, Dr. Trubush, the Gazette, as well as uh, the television station was there. I think that's part of that increased awareness uh, that uh, we can all contribute and, and all learn a lot from each other as well as our community partners. There is a role for El Paso County Public Health, and, and that role, I think Heather will talk a little bit about it, and as well as Corey will highlight what's happening in the schools, but it's really about public education and prevention, particularly focused on youth. I think we do have an important role as, as we learn from our nurses. They're out in the community, and they're talking about resilience, and they're talking about um, a access to services. And so I think as we educate our community, I think public health will play a very important role about, in that role of education. And finally, as a, uh, as a essential partner, you know, access to mental health services and access to treatment is essential for folks that are currently uh, suffering from substance use disorder. As a fam family doc for many years, you know, we recognized early people have medical problems or mental health issues, and we refer them to the specialists, and that's what we do. And I think that's as we increase access to, to mental health services and to substance abuse treatment, we can get people off the drugs. And as uh, uh, our commissioner mentioned, uh, drug take back is this weekend. And I think we there's a lot of opportunity to get rid of those <laughs> pills that are not only antibiotics, but Oxycontin in your, in your fridge or wherever you keep them. To get, keep them out of the hands of kids and keep them off the streets. And finally, I, I wanted to say a, a big shout out to our safety partners. I, I think our safety partners are critical in law enforcement that are gonna be our partners in working going forward. They have a very important role in keeping fentanyl off the streets as well as all drugs. So I wanna give a shout out, and of course, a shout out to Dr. Leon Cali, who does a tremendous job, as you all know, of uh, keeping us uh, abreast of the data. So he's our partner, we're all in this together, and I just wanted to highlight those things, and I, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey next, um, who will talk a little about what's happening in the schools, and Heather will talk about what we're doing more specifically in, our, in, in the public health department. So, I'll, and I'll be around for questions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Notstein. I serve as the Executive Director of Student Success and Wellness for School District 11, and I was looking at your agenda, and usually I have to speak to our board about COVID updates, so I'm really actually excited that I'm not doing that today. Uh, but I'm unfortunately talking about yet the, the emerging sort of epidemic that we're seeing regarding fentanyl and how it's impacting youth. Uh, if you did catch some of the presentation that happened last week, you heard a lot about the age that this is impacting, and it's a much lower age than what we've seen with typical overdoses in that, in that mid-30 range. Um, the impact that it's having, at least within our district and what we're seeing across other K-12 entities within our city, is students engaging in, sometimes for the first time, substance use. When we think about substance use, it's more of on a spectrum. We know that we have individuals that are dependent upon substance because of underlying health and uh, issues that they're trying to support on their own. We also know that it emerges from mental health impairments where they're trying to self-medicate. We also know that the individuals fall into substance abuse for lots of reasons, but there are a spectrum. You know, we have those habitual users, we have those occasional users that uh, procure sometimes uh, regularly prescribed drugs from their, their physician, but also then turn to the illicit market to obtain them uh, when those prescriptions run out. We also have those initial users, which is really where we're talking about with many of our youth. Uh, we see our youth starting to engage in substance use as early as uh, late elementary school, we start to see the, an onset around fifth grade of risky behaviors, right? And that ranges from suicidal ideation and worries about just families and the impacts of their environment on themselves. And then we start to see that start to progress into middle school and high school. And just some of those numbers that we, we pull from arrive from the Healthy Kids Survey. Uh, many of our school districts in our community don't participate in that. And it's really honestly a shame that they don't. Uh, because we have an underestimated number of youth that are being impacted by substance use, by mental health needs. And these are some of the tools that we as systems can actually turn to. Uh, we know that one in four of our middle school students that have been surveyed participate or used vape pens, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why this is important to know. Uh, about 14% have used marijuana, and about 11% of have used prescription drugs by middle school. We also know that our high school students, about one in three have used a vape pen before, one in three have tried marijuana, and 17% have used prescription medication, right? And that's not intended for 
medical use, but illicit use. And the reason for that is because we're seeing fentanyl show up in lots of places. It's not as though individuals are going out and purely purchasing fentanyl, right? And there may be the occasional dependent user that might be using that directly, but the, the honest assessment that we're seeing is that fentanyl is turning up in things like um, Ill illicitly produced prescription medication, right? And so we might see that pressed into a pill, uh, Percocet, other, other types of opioids that we might see that they think are safe to be used, uh, but unfortunately are laced with what we've heard is, you know, as minimal as micrograms that can cause an overdose. We also have seen that this has turned up in marijuana, right? So while we have marijuana dispensaries and while people may purchase that legally, uh, we also know that there's still an illicit market for marijuana, and we know that we find fentanyl laced within marijuana. And we also have started to understand that our vape pens, we have heard and, and have seen cases ourselves of overdose related to vape use, right? And so there's not a lot of evidence out there from the DEA's office regarding this just yet, but we are seeing it turn up in vape pens, and we've had students actually transported because of an overdose related to uh, vape use. And so if we, if we don't have a strong understanding of where this is coming into our community, what is it that we're actually going to do about it? And I think that's really what we are going to try to uh, address ourselves within the K-12 education. And I'll speak just in a moment about what we think public health might be able to help support us with. Uh, but we've launched a fake and fatal campaign. And we started to experience fentanyl impacts back in November of 2021. With our first case, we've now seen over eight overdoses related to that. Five of them, fortunately, have been um, successful recoveries with the use of Narcan, right? And so from that point, we decided that it would become necessary to impact or to uh, address the impact of fentanyl use or um, overdoses with the input of Narcan within our school, right? How could we increase access to Narcan, train our staff to be able to do that, order that through the state bulk system and, and have that readily available should we um, come across additional cases. Uh, additionally, what we've started to do is create video information for our families and our students. And so we launched some of that back in late February uh, to both our staff to start bringing awareness. I think we've heard uh, Dr. Arbina talk about that. It's like, oh, first, first thing is awareness. What are we gonna do? And then eventually, how are we gonna educate our youth? Uh, so part of that's already been taking place through some video production. On uh, May 12th, we're having another panel just for our community and our families to talk about this with experts and see what we can do to increase the awareness. But we really do need to step up our education for our youth. Uh, many of our youth don't understand what fentanyl is even yet. Um, so trying to bring awareness to that, trying to bring awareness to that. Many of them think they're actually for taking drugs for the first time potentially that are safe. And what I mean by safe is that they're not laced with, they think they're getting it from their parents' cabinet where it might be a safe place to get some drugs, right? Or they might be getting it from their friends where they already got it from their parents where they think it's safe. And, and we all recognize that illicit drugs aren't safe, but when, when I talk about safe, I mean safe from fentanyl. And when fentanyl ends itself up in any of these types of illicit drugs, it becomes deadly. And what we've seen more often than not, it takes very little to drop an individual, right? They cease breathing and it takes an immediate response. Now, the problem with what we're seeing with fentanyl is because of the potency, it's taking more than just one dose of Narcan, right? You see those nasal sprays? We've had to administer over five doses on an individual child within our own school setting. And these aren't our SROs that are showing up. These are principals. These are staff that have no medical training that we've taught to use Narcan. So imagine putting yourself in a place where you're just a teacher coming across a child and knowing that you're gonna to have to make that next life-saving you know, intervention using Narcan. That's not an easy thing to do to store that much Narcan and be able to administer it correctly in an emergency setting when you're not an emergency responder, right? It takes roughly five minutes for EMS to get there on site. Five minutes when you can't breathe, right, has a huge impact on a child's brain. And so we have to have immediate response. Procuring Narcan is not easy for school districts. Um, there has to be board policy that has to be enacted. It has to be ordered through the state bulk system. The bulk system is now delayed, right? So if we're a district that already has done this, and now you think about the other 16 or so in our community that don't have it, what's the delayed process for that? And how can public health actually step up and support access to that? You all are going to receive funding for the opioid <clears throat> dis settlement disbursement. What are you going to do with it, right? Are you going to help with educating our youth? 
Are you going to think about detox centers for our youth? We have very few substance abuse disorder specialists in our community for youth, right? When we talk about those that are using, trying to find supports for them are extremely challenging. We already had a mental health crisis in our community. Without resources for that, what are we going to do to help with substance abuse? And so really it is for all you to think about. How is it we're going to spur up the opportunity for access to this? Uh, schools only can have and only do have so many FT. I know all of you have the struggle here at Public Health with the same thing. Um, but they're not experts in this. So what can we do to make them more aware and be able to respond? And I think those are the challenges that we're faced with. Uh, I know all of you have a deep concern for how are we going to keep our health of our, our youth of our health safety or our youth safe during this time. And so uh, I don't know the exact answer. I don't know any of us do. Um, but we do have some strategies that we think we're going to put in place to help educate uh, our community. And we look forward to the continued partnership with public health that we've had a deep partnership with. Um, Susan mentioned a few of those things, but District 11 is going to continue to lean on all of you and your expertise um, as we move forward. And, and hopefully we can tackle this next challenge together and make our communities much safer for our youth and, and protect as many lives as possible. So thank you. Thank you, Corey. And Heather. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to speak to some of the efforts that we have in place already. And I've I've been here. Um, I believe it was maybe last month or or prior, just to talk a little bit about this. And I'll I'll go into that today. So um, there's a lot of words on that slide, and I'll just. Um, go through some of the, the points that are related to community health promotion. And um, you've heard me talk, we have had a, a competitive process in looking at bringing on a behavioral health planner. This is a new position for uh, public health, and um, I hope and I'm optimistic that by our May uh, board meeting that we're able to introduce an individual and uh, who's going through the process of, of coming on. And um, they, it's not, uh, I'm not able to announce that yet because it's in the contingency phase, but again, optimistic. And that position really is to focus on behavioral health, uh, working with community partners, accessing resources, making assessments, and um, helping pull the community uh, together in that space with a focus on behavioral health. Um, we have care coordinators that have uh, work with our maternal child health program that work on references or excuse me referrals, access to resources, uh, helping bring down barriers and walls and really connecting families and people in need to any kind of resource and related to uh, substance use and working with our uh, justice, system and jail population, vulnerable populations in the community. Um, we have our CTC uh, program, which is Communities That Care, and that's in the Fountain Valley area. And this uh, program, so I'm just going to refer to my notes here a little bit, um, Lead Community Mobilizer for Fountain Valley Communities That Care Coalition. This has been in place since 2016, so this is not new to us. And this group works to increase and improve protective factors that help to reduce harm. And protective factors are family support, educational support, access to resources, all of the things that we work to surround youth with that help strengthen them so that they don't go down a path. And this is preventative and upstream practices. Um, within CTC, we have prevention and policy specialists. They work with CTC to support upstream evidence-based community programs. Some of that, or an example of that, would be safe spaces for youth. And we have a youth action board that's very active in working with their peers and providing opportunities, dialogue, resources, connections for prevention. Community outreach coordinator, which assists youth, substance use prevention, staff engaging in non-traditional community partners. We, when we say community partners, there's an image that comes to our mind. This group focuses on those um, traditional community partners, but also looking at faith-based sector, business owner sector, um, community leaders, schools, and um, all of those partners, again, to surround our youth and community to help with prevention. 
And I think that's all I have. If there's any questions or questions for the others? Yes, questions from board members. For any of our vendors. I, I do have a couple yeah. of questions for Corey. I ran too far away. Fine. No, well, thank you, and your uh, your presentation was was informative, and I appreciate it. Can you just a few specific questions? How many times has Narcan Narcan been used in D eleven? Mm -hmm. So we've had five administrations of Narcan. Since when? Oh, hmm. um, are you asking specifically about D eleven staff intervening with Narcan? Or are you talking about? let's say AMR on site administering anything like that. So well, if, clear. You could, if you could break it out, that would be helpful. If it's yeah. more than five, if we include AMR or is it a total? No, of five it'd, be a, it'd be a total of five, but I uh -huh. think one of those early cases, we didn't have it on site. So we were reliant on emergency responders that to administer. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so it's been, there's been five episodes where Narcan has been needed or used. Was starting when was that starting in January of 2021? It would have been November of what year? 2021. Mm -hmm. Since November of 2021. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, we're not aware of every case that involves external overdoses. So, for example, two of the cases we know happened <coughs> at uh, a home, um, and so I couldn't speak to ex explicitly how the. You know, res emergency responders respond to those particular cases. I want to make the assumption that they were able to do that, but I can't speak to a certainty. But those aren't part of the five year. Uh, they did not include those in the five. Okay. No. <clears throat> and and th this is interesting to me. Do, is there Narcan located now at each D11 school, at each D11 high school? Yeah, uh, only at some or so every high school has um, multiple doses on site. Um, our middle schools also have a few doses. Our elementaries do not yet. And I spoke a little bit to the distribution from the state and through our state ordering process. Uh, those orders have been delayed, so they're not on site. And the reason for elementary, for clarity, people might be asking, why would we put Narcan at elementary school? And I think the answer becomes. Well, children are apt to pick up things and put them in their mouth, right? The other day, for example, we found a pill on a playground. Don't know yeah. what it was, but a child could have put it in their mouth. Yeah. Um, and so we want to be prepared for those sort of circumstances. And who who can who has it? Is it a school nurse? Is or who who has it? So we store in a couple of key locations. So um, there's a couple of people that have it. High schools. We know that our SROs carry it. Uh, so we know the CSPD has it on them, but again, they only carry limited numbers, so they may have only have one on their physical body at a time. So that's a challenge for CSPD if they respond and it takes more than one dose. Uh, we do have it then uh, in a couple key locations. We procure, you know, we store it in our nursing facility on site, but we also store it with our security because they're both primary responders uh, at our high school and middle school settings. So at high schools, the SRO has it, the nursing office has it, and security. then another security. Yeah, we have D11 security in addition to uh, CSPD on site. Is there a nurse at each high school? There is, full time. School nurse. Mm -hmm. They're not full time at our elementary and middle school. Um, however, we do have like health technicians on site, and those individuals are also trained on how to administer. Sure. And. You know, you mentioned uh, if we don't understand, this is kind of a quote, if we don't understand how this is coming into our communities, how are we going to impact it? What was the answer to that? How is it coming into our communities? I couldn't speak to that, sir. You'd have to ask law enforcement that question. Okay, so we don't understand it then. Mm -hmm. um, I right. can tell you how our, our, how our youth are procuring it, you know what I mean? I think we've yeah. seen examples of that yeah. through... Uh, illicit purchases um, from dealers within the community. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we know that we're, our students are getting access to it. But I couldn't tell you how it ends up in Colorado Springs. Those, those, may, may I, so just to that question, so we, they, um, law enforcement was a heavy presence on the panel last week. And um, Dr. Bina, maybe um, he can help me out here. But, you know, from a more global aspect rather than, in D11, um, they had talked about the cartels 
Um, yeah. And then also that um, fentanyl also is is it's uh, um, financial in the sense of you know if you're you're putting it with drugs. I mean you they they had talked about the enormous profit that the drug dealers are making, um, and so globally that's how it's coming into. Um, our community, and then also one of the um, law enforcement representatives, or maybe it was Michael Allen, um, had um, some pretty grave concerns about another type of fentanyl synthetic product um, being used. And since it's synthetic, um, it's much more easier to um, mm. put in with the, mm. the illicit drugs. But that's that's what I recall from the panel. Yeah, and I, I would speculate like Susan would based on what the experts at the panel were saying, so I'm not an expert on how... Sure. Drugs are trafficked in our community. Those five incidents, are they, were they all at high schools? Yes. And were, can you tell me which high schools? Which no, I will not, sir. No. It's in the public news, though, right? It was in the Gazette. There's some information that has been released, but I won't release that because, and here's why, because it then ties back to a specific student. If we had like hundreds of cases of it where I could keep the protection of individuals' families safe from who that individual was that would overdose, it would be a breach of confidentiality on my part. Have there been more than one incident at any high school? Has one high school had two or three incidents? Are you asking, do you, are you, I know you want to get to like where it's happening. No, no I'm not going to ask you that. I'm just okay. asking, has there been more than one yes. incident at a high school? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it may be concentrated in one school and that school needs more uh, focus than potentially uh, broad. Potentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Those are yeah, sensors. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Corey, yeah, you, Corey. May I just uh, emphasize also, because we work yeah. with so many different partners, um, 17 different school districts. And you know we we invited um, Corey here um, because he's just been a, a strong partner and, and he was available. But you know when we have a um, youth substance use prevention effort in uh, the city of Fountain, it's really where are folks um, ready to step up and, and demonstrate some leadership to take on the funding and, and to follow through with some of those prevention efforts. But you know in in um, uh, also response to. Um, your question, uh, Mr. Donaldson, is that you know we'll 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 be working and we do work with our our schools uh, very heavily. And then what you're asking around identifying, you know, maybe you know by zip code or getting 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 more narrow, or is this like where can we focus focus our efforts? Um, and I, I see you shaking your head, and I want to acknowledge, but mm -hmm. I, I just I I just don't want anyone to walk away with um, the impression that since you're willing to speak, yeah, that thanks, then Susan. there's attention to it because. Um, you know, across the board, um, we've got a lot of challenges with in the entire, uh, you know, mm. county and, and things that we we need to step up some some efforts. And, yeah. and public health will be a strong partner in that. Yeah. And you know, this is you know, there, there's a, there's a lot to learn here. I, I think for um, for public health and the ways in which we can uh, work together. And I think that you know, the model that sticks in my mind is that um, when we address teen suicide. That was um, enormous. Um, something that that you know, there's not an A Z book. Hey, you do this, and then you're going to have 100% uh, reduction in uh, teen suicides. But we came to the table. Um, we were very open and honest. We were vulnerable as as leaders and in, in school superintendents and, and representatives in figuring out, you know, what where can we target our our efforts because you know our kids kids deserve. Um, you know, the, this, this work that, that we're doing. So I just wanted to emphasize that because I greatly appreciate your, your partnership oh, in, sure. in D11s. And so I just wanted to make sure that if there's anyone listening, yeah. um, that, that it's, 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 you know, countywide that, that we have some challenges that we need to step up. Let me Mr. President. pile on that just a minute. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, another approach, which is that this is a national security issue. And D.A. Allen at the town hall mentioned the federal partners. And I think it's important in this venue also, following on Susan's comment, is that we raise our sights a little bit and say these are component drugs that are coming from China, assembled in Mexico, uh, put in some kind of form that can be distributed, and then, and then brought across the border. So there's, there's another level. You know, public health, we like to look upstream. And, and I think it's important, it, and I'm sure they are, our federal partners look at the upstream causes of this fentanyl epidemic as well. 
I would completely agree. I mean, those are things that reside outside of the school district's ability to impact. But where we really do have an impact is thinking about those upstream efforts mm -hmm. um, and, and spe specifically on prevention efforts, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a huge spectrum of this. Everything from abstinence practices of saying you should never use to harm reduction practices to bring students back from those habitual practices into a place where it's safe. And then all of a sudden now they've stopped themselves. But the bigger issue is underlying why are so many people in our community unwell in the sense that their mental health is struggling and then they turn to things like this. But there's some, this is a complex problem and you're, you're correct. And you know, how we address that will be a universal approach from many partners. And I think we're just one entity and to Susan's point, we're not the only district being impacted, but we're certainly one of the ones that are stepping up and trying to make an effort early on in this effort. So I appreciate the time and I can't speak for every district either, so I won't try to. So if you ask me certain questions, I can't answer. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming today. Absolutely. Mr. President, yeah. I have one follow-up question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you kind of just addressed it, and and that is what I what I was going to ask is I would imagine you <clears throat> kind of keep your eyes on on the whole uh, county and other school districts. <clears throat> so, really, you we've only talked about D eleven and maybe five incidents in D eleven. That's right. Do you have a uh, do you know a number for the entire county, all the school districts in the county? D 11s had five, but there have been 25 in the county, or there have been That's eight in the county. Question: I don't know that answer. And um, Dr. Kelly obviously sees the the far end of the spectrum. We and he spoke a little bit to the number of deaths related to um, opioids, or not opioids, but specifically fentanyl. Yeah. Um, some of the challenges that we're seeing with the overdose pieces too is that, and some of the medical experts on the panel could probably speak to this a little bit better too. But when when you overdose and end up in the ER. We're not always sure exactly what you've overdosed on. Now, if you potentially had Narcan and administered and you responded to that, we can assume it's an opioid, right? Because it yeah. brought you back. But unless that individual is willing to go under like a urine sample or a blood draw to figure out what's actually happened, we're not going to actually know that it's explicitly related to that. We have a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Um, so those numbers are probably a little bit either underestimated or unknown for what we're seeing. Um, and Dr. Vu, I don't know if you could help me out on that or not about just in terms of that that practice, but um, but um, there's certainly a piece of our unknowing of the numbers. Uh, but I yeah. couldn't answer all the county schools, but I do know other schools have been impacted, not just District 11 for overdoses. Okay, thanks. Because they have turned to us and yeah, asked so us for support. Thank you, Corey. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Thank you for your presentation. You're right in the field is really impossible to know which. Uh, uh, substance is uh, the cause of the overdose. But can I ask you maybe there's something I don't understand. Can I ask you, sure. is, is there a lack of Narcan at the school? Is it because of the lack of availability, uh, the supply to Nar of Narcan to the schools? So there's specific state legislation that allows for school districts or other groups to obtain Narcan. Uh, you have to pull down an open script, right, from an open order from the state or we could turn to a medical provider and get uh, an order filled. However, in order for us to fill those, those scripts, we actually have to have Board of Education policy that explicitly states that we are going to be able to procure and warehouse Narcan and that we're gonna train appropriately of our staff in order to be able to administer, which makes a lot of sense, right? We wouldn't. Now, that process, like any board policy, takes a time to get through, but there's a delay, right? You think that's maybe a month, maybe two months from a start to finish of a board approval because the number of times they meet. In addition to that, if there's a delay at the delivery point, if we're all pulling down from the bulk state ordering system, that may be delayed, which we're seeing now. The question becomes, is there enough on site in our county if D11 in every school district turned to some other one to fill those scripts? I don't know the answer to that, but if you think about if we're going to have to have at least five doses per potential case, you multiply that at the factor that you think you might need in any particular school, you're talking probably about thousands of doses at schools across the county, not just D11, and, and you know we put an order in for over 150 or so just to have on hand. Hopefully we don't need to use them. But that is a challenge um, to be able to get those things filled. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Obina, maybe, again, maybe it's my confusion. Could you please remind us, uh, is Narcan in Colorado, is it over the counter? 
Thank you, Corey. Uh, great, great answers and, and, and great uh, information. Yes, it is over the counter. You can uh, get uh, a, a prescription. Uh, you actually don't need a prescription Correct. because the state medical officer has written an open prescription for this. Mm -hmm. You can just go to the pharmacy and get a dosage of Narcan. Now, it's not free. Uh, and so that's part of the challenge is that uh, there are free programs in other counties that offer Narcan. There are training programs. We haven't taken advantage of that in El Paso County, but it is difficult. There are some treatment centers like some of the mental health services, the substance use disorders that actually do provide treatment. There are other community uh, providers. And maybe we'll get Heather and I to work on this to kind of find out where Narcan is available. Mm -hmm. And we'll provide some information possibly on our website in the future so that we can pub publicly uh, give people that information. But it is available. Yes, it is. Thank you. So I guess that's the disconnect in my mind. Uh, if anyone can just go over the counter and get Narcan without a prescription, is is the problem is the barriers just regulations within the schools that the school cannot purchase now can over the counter or is it lack of funding it's multiple pieces so based on the way the legislation is written specific for schools we just couldn't go down to cvs and have our staff buy it right for themselves a couple problems with that one they're not trained uh, to have that to the legislation says we will train and we'll procure it in this safe way and so for us that's the challenge is the legislation, the way it's written, requires us to do certain things. Sure. And there is actually a, a website, I was trying to pull it up, um, to, where you can find every spot in the city where you can purchase Narcan from a, a local um, pharmacy. Right, right. So there is, I forget what it's called, it's like Stop the Something, I can't remember it. Yeah. We'll make sure, Dr. Google, we'll put it on our website so people can get that connection. Thank you. Great. But, but thank you, it just doesn't make sense to me that anyone can get Narcan over, over the counter and that person does not have to be trained. Where in a situation of a school where Narcan is likely more needed, then there is barrier that people are required to be trained to purchase Narcan, that's all. Yeah, if Dr. Trevish, if I could, just to uh, <clears throat> share a thought, some of it I'm sure is liability. The schools don't want a teacher who personally purchased Narcan to run up and administer it to a student who became unconscious because they're you know hypoglycemic and they're shooting Narcan into them, then the parents get upset. So, yeah, maybe it's uh, it's the school boards that that need to go ahead and address this, and I think that's a good way to do it. And uh, and then there just would need to be training. Sounds like the school nurse would be <coughs> the perfect place to do that, or the SROs. Uh, and it sounds like there hasn't, and, and perhaps and Corey, you could answer this. It sounds like there hasn't been a case where it's been needed in a school. Uh, and it wasn't um, administered either by the SRO or by AMR. Right. I mean, when when emergency responders have shown up and there's a belief or, in, in this case, what we know about Narcan, let's just say we have we can't figure out what the responsiveness is. And in this case, not something that might be related to their, their diabetes, but something else you can administer narcan and it shows no 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 issues with administering it but to your point i think it makes a lot of sense that yes every time that uh, first responders come out they've done their job they've responded in the appropriate way and they've had it available to them thank you for your leadership corey and and being with us today and thank you dr Urbina and, and heather also for providing us um, some really good information, and I think you know every every board meeting we you know we had a presentation last um, last month, and this will um, be on uh, the agenda as we um, learn more and 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 make additional uh, progress and and working together. And so, thank you. And we are going to turn now to COVID. And if um, Fadi, you want to come up and and give an update, and then Dr. Urbina also will update us on some of the treatments as as we hit. Um, discussed previously. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to share some high-level updates on COVID. I'm glad to be in front of you sharing uh, a quick version of COVID, uh, contrary to what we used to. Uh, we're transitioning to um, looking at COVID uh, in terms of global trends, national trends, and local trends as we um, sustain this effort into a long-term uh, phase of the pandemic. The uh, global trends are good, uh, mostly uh, decreasing pattern in terms of the cases and the deaths. The graph in front of you is coming from uh, the New York Times. It's as of yesterday's poll. 
the um, global trends, as you see on the screen and in front of you on the papers, uh, have been decreasing for the last 90 days, uh, even about 120 days. Eventually, we're going to get to a point where it levels off, and that's a natural progression of a decreasing pattern. You're going to go down, go down, go down until you hit a consistent number of cases that's leveled off. So in the next month or so, if you start hearing that uh, the decrease has stopped or has leveled off, that's not necessarily bad news. That's just the nature of a decreasing pattern. The number of cases applies, uh, this limitation applies to all the data that we share today. Number of cases is very hard to um, rely on right now because the number of unreported and undetected cases uh, that we are um, suspecting are out there. But the number of deaths and the number of hospitalizations are reaffirming this good news nature of the decreasing pattern. Next slide, please. When it comes to the national trends, the good news continue. Most of the country, per the CDC's uh, level categorization, are under the low level or the green level, with some hot spots in the northeast up there and some in the Midwest. Uh, you'll likely continue to hear this sort of analogy of small fires as, as we continue with this uh, detection of the number of cases. Mostly everyone is doing well with small outbreaks here and there. Currently, those small hot spots are in the northeast and the Midwest. Next slide, please. Locally, again, good news. We're following the trend of the global and the national uh, patterns. The number of cases, with a caveat, has been decreasing uh, since January, definitely through February and March. The number of hospitalizations is also going the right way, and the number of deaths, uh, additionally, is going the right way. This all leads to the conclusion from multiple clues that we're in a good place uh, from COVID, even though we can't really rely on the number of cases. The number of hospitalizations and deaths um, I want to caveat a little bit here, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in terms of the variance. Eventually, we're going to get to a point where percent change may not be a reliable number without the raw counts. Because if a percent change dominates a headline, it may not represent the full picture without seeing the raw count. So I just want to uh, throw out there that if you see a headline that says 50% change from yesterday, you have to look at the raw counts in order to fully understand the picture. If we have 10 and next week we have 12, that's going to uh, lead to a significant percent change compared to before, and it may dominate the headlines, and it may not represent the true picture. Next slide, please. And it's starting to show itself with uh, variants. Uh, you may have heard in the news that the BA2 has had a mutation, and now it's determined to be the BA2.12.1. BA uh, it's now accounting for about a quarter to a third of the cases. Locally, the CDPAJ data lags a little bit behind the CDC data. As of 4.10, that percentage is about 10%. Regionally, the CDC is estimating to be closer to one-third. Uh, this is the caveat I wanted to mention, and that in the uh, in the headlines you may see that BA2.12.1 is now responsible for 50% of the cases, or you may hear that it's rising. Uh, it's really important to look at the full picture and the raw counts because what may happen is the variant that is new, the the new player on the table is going to dominate other variants. So it's going to progress and increase as other variants sort of go out of the picture. A normal progression in virology. So if you see a 50% increase in the uh, sub-variant of BA2, uh, just make sure to look at the number of cases as well in order to understand that it's it may be replacing cases, it may not be creating a rise. And everything from literature, everything the WHO and the CDC are saying about this sub-variant doesn't uh, give any different information than the original BA2 uh, variant. Next slide, please. And I think finally, we just wanted to update you on the uh, dashboard. We made additional uh, changes to it uh, as we continue to have additional capacity to take a look at data presentations. We're now uh, making it more efficient. Uh, we're moving it to uh, updating once a week on Tuesdays so that on Wednesday we have fresh data. We combined COVID and vaccines into one place so that it's a one-stop shop. And we simplified some graphics. We added a uh, death per 100,000 for the top 10 counties in Colorado. As we move the data presentation from a daily um, incidence and test positivity into a longer term understanding of the COVID indicators. That's it for data. I'll be happy to field any questions. Questions from or comments from board members, please. Questions. Yes, sir. Um, Fadi, the last 14 days on, on the previous yep. couple previous slides, three deaths, is yep. that correct, yep. from COVID? Mm -hmm. How many deaths from fentanyl? Uh, one of the challenges with fentanyl deaths and basically any non-COVID data yeah. is that we struggle with timely, real-time granular data. Uh, we're looking into some sources to capture that. 
But beyond uh, news and beyond Dr. Kelly's report, we struggle with having uh, up to date. Now, Dr. Kelly <coughs> shares his report with us, and it usually comes in March, April, or May of the next year. So right now, we're evaluating 2021 data. People have become used to uh, real-time data because sure. of COVID. Sure. Unfortunately, we don't have that. Uh, we are working on some solutions and looking at what other counties are doing and having real-time um, deaths and real-time ED and ER ho hospital visitors, but we're not there yet. In the, just off of, and maybe we just don't track these numbers, yep. just from the Gazette or from the cases that we do know where you know, PD, the police mm -hmm. department reports, yes, they died from fentanyl overdose. Do we know how many fentanyl overdoses have, and deaths have occurred in uh, El Paso County in the last month? That I don't know. I can only speak to 21 data from Dr. Kelly's report. Um, okay. Apologies for that. And um, am I kind of what I'm getting at is maybe that's becoming more of a real threat to uh, to life mm -hmm. in uh, El Paso County than COVID is, and maybe that would make more sense as our if we're going to have a focus a uh, a data dashboard which focuses on one cause of mortality. Um, if fentanyl is what we want to focus on, maybe that's where we should go versus uh, COVID, which is uh, kind of receding now it, it do we have a plan to get rid of the covid dashboard at any point is it is there a circumstance where we're going to say okay this is used has been useful but we do no longer need it i don't know of any plans uh would likely follow any uh, state trends if the state deems that the state dashboard is no longer necessary we'll probably look for that insight for your first point um, I don't think it has to be either or uh, we now with the additional capacity of COVID response slowed down we are exploring these uh, sort of uh, metrics that are important to everyone and it includes fentanyl so in the future you may receive updates of a dashboard that looks at that uh, we are looking onto that but I don't think it has to be either or it doesn't you know it doesn't have to replace COVID yeah. it can exist in both worlds and I, I would agree it doesn't have to be either or, but I think maybe the uh, the usefulness of our COVID uh, dashboard is, is uh, you know, becoming less mm -hmm. useful all the time. And maybe maybe we should change our focus. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Mr. Donaldson, I, I'd like to address that. Um, so <coughs> I, I think that those are the, those are really um, good questions around the data. I mean, one one of our, um, you know, visions in, in public health and what we've worked to um, you know, build an office of, you know, science, epidemiology, and, and um, technology is that, you know, we want to have as, as real-time data as, as we can in, in forming relationships with hospitals and, and getting the data and, you know, what is of interest um, to those that, that work in the fields that, that need the data to um, take action on, on prevention plans or um, treatment, but then also, you know, what's, what's of interest in, in the public. And so we do have um, still some data information um, on influenza. And, and so we track that because um, it might not be 100,000 you know, hits um, on the website. Um, people are still interested in that. And then um, it's also more efficient too when we work with media that we're not having to manually give them information that they can just go to the dashboard. Um, and then that, that saves us time. So we have scaled down our data dashboard as specific to, to COVID. Um, and I do foresee you know, in the future as um, the response and recovery changes than what other aspects um, of the data might be useful. So, for example, you know, we're working on uh, the determinants of health. And we know that within the COVID response, um, it highlighted what public health already knew, that there was um, significant impacts to, um, you know, those in, in, in various uh, communities that are uh, have more of an impact on the determinants of health and, you know, whether it's housing or, you know, whether you have a job or whether you have access to nutritious food. So we have been working um, on a data dashboard and hopefully soon within maybe the next couple of months, um, we've been working with economic development. We've been working with the Pikes Peak workforce. We've been working with um, numerous different partners to um, get that dashboard um, where it needs to be um, to, to highlight with the public. So as we um, learn more and, and transition back to some of our um, other higher priorities, w you'll see that reflected um, on the website and people still will be able to access um, the information, but it might, it, it probably won't be um, as highlighted. And, you know, I think one of the values of, of working with um, Dr. Leon Kelly 
over the years um, is that he tries to get us um, as real time information as possible, whether that's um, you know teen suicides or on any aspect. And so that's an effort that we will work on. And um, I think your your point is well taken that um, people want easy access to you know what related to substance use. Um, you know, what is available, you know, as far as data and school districts and, you know, how can we do it in a way that doesn't identify um, individuals? That's uh, greatly important to us. And so I, I would just say stay tuned. Um, you know, every single month we'll, we'll make some progress and, and change what we're presenting as, as an agency, more in line also um, with transitioning back to our um, community health improvement plan priorities, which are um, obesity and, and nutrition and, and overweight. We know that heart disease. Um, you know, is the number one killer. And, and so we need to get back to some of um, those priorities, also substance use um, and, and misuse, and then the days that, um, of, of poor mental health days that, that people experience in the community. So we will be shifting, but it's gonna be, um, it's, it's gonna take a little bit of um, time. But I, I think that those are good questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and I just- Commissioner Bremer had a question. Please. Sorry, um, you know, I look forward um, Council Member Donaldson to uh, to a transition away from COVID as well, but I do hope that we can figure out a way, as Fadi said, to to not uh, it doesn't have to be either or. I look forward to uh, being able to still pull on the historical data, especially as we've refined the dashboard over time, um, to be more reflective of actual actual incidence rate, actual numbers, um, and I do look forward to that historical data being there kind of permanently and and not as a focus. Um, I think that that's just um, a good transparent service to all of our citizens, even in the after after aftermath. Um, and once this is not a top priority and responsiveness, I look forward to still being able to, to see and study and learn from that data a little bit. Um, because I think that learning, um, as you well know, will, will continue for a long time. Commissioner Gonzalez. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my question, so what, what restrictions or mandates are still in place from the state or federal? Uh, I think the only thing maybe on, on hospital uh, personnel, but what's, what's still in place? Very few. Yeah. Um, let me see if Dr. Um, Urbina has an update, but um, the majority is there's there's not any in there's only one mandate that I'm aware of and that's the federal mask uh, on transportation and I think it ends in mid-May uh, except in Florida which I, has made that change most local communities including El Paso County have uh, lifted most of their restrictions the state has listed lifted their restrictions as well and now it's become assessing your risk an individual risk I'm over 65 I have chronic medical conditions and I take care of a 95-year-old man who uh, who's at risk of getting infection, so that's why I wear a mask indoors. Now, just recommendations, and not a no longer a mandate. So there's no more restrictions on like nurses and doctors who are having that's, the vaccines. That's different. That's in, in an individual facility, particularly okay. if they have concerns about communicable disease spread, whether or not it's a hepatitis A or okay, but influenza. that's not a mandate. It's a it's a yeah, self-imposed by yeah, those. That's correct. They're, they're trying okay. to protect their hospital okay. employees as thank well you. as the patients for sure. Right, thank you. And Dr. Turbush, yes. if I could, wasn't the uh, transportation rule about mass, wasn't that just struck down by a court and it's no longer? In Florida, it's being uh, challenged right now by the Justice Department. Uh, so we're, I would guess in the next couple of weeks we'll hear more about it. But isn't it the case if you go to the airport today or you fly on a plane, you don't, you're not required to wear a mask? It varies with the airlines. They're still requiring it. Yes, correct. Okay, thanks. Um, a couple more things. Thank you, Com Commissioner Bremer, also for the historical data. I think what Fadi was also saying about, you know, you hear on the news, oh, it's increasing 70 percent, it's this, it's that. And, you know, you really have to, we really have to help you know, the public understand um, the raw numbers. And, um, you know, oftentimes throughout the pandemic, I've always heard, um, you know, El Paso County has the highest number of deaths. They but we have the highest number of population as well. And one of the reasons why we put the death rates per 100,000 for the 10 most populous counties so people can look to apples to apples, um, you know, on, on really some, some better understanding and perspective on the data. So we are working and we have been working on after action reports. Um, we will have an executive summary um, that also helps us understand as a community, you know, how did we perform with different metrics 
And then more importantly, too, you know, what actions are we going to put in place to strengthen um, a next response <coughs> um, to something? So I think that that's, that's very important that, that we'll have that, that information available. Yeah, and just one last comment, and Dr. Urbina will close us out. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, questions like, hey, tell me the number of fentanyl deaths in the last X and Y. It gives us sort of research questions. We go out and see if we can answer. So, and that goes to everyone on this table. We really appreciate questions like that because it gives us sort of a problem to investigate. And, and Dr. Turbridge, I just wanted to end. Are you? I have one more slide. Yes. Okay. But do you want go me to ahead. go first? Go ahead. Okay, good. I also wanted to comment on Mr. Allison's question. Um, we have a responsibility as a local health department to uh, monitor trends in communicable disease, influenza, as, as Susan mentioned, uh, hepatitis A, uh, or rabies, out, rabies uh, dogs and animals, and wild animals. So we'll be still monitoring COVID for forever, probably, as long as it exists in our community. Um, so we may not be doing a presentation at the Board of Health, but I think it's important to still continue to monitor. You're exactly right. So I'd like to end, if you, well, you question. I would just like to say that I uh, fully understand that. You know, as my role in the military when I was a PA for units that deployed to Iraq, I and my medics were the guys who uh, tested the water quality, inspected the food, supervised the establishment of latrines. So I'm like personally experienced in doing this at a low level, right, for the thousand men and women. So I absolutely grasps what the function of public health. We administered all the immunizations for our unit, you know, and then we treated wounds, our casualties, our communicable diseases. My uh, thoughts are that we don't need to highlight one disease if it has receded in uh, its significance. We don't, we don't have a, a data dashboard for uh, tuberculosis cases anymore, I don't believe. It certainly isn't the number one thing when you hit our website, or the, the public health heads website. We don't do it for STDs, although they're, it's all important, but we choose what, uh, what to highlight. And I think you've, you've both addressed that. I'm just restating my thoughts. Awesome. Um, Councilman Donaldson, I um, appreciate your comments. However, I do think the historical value is important, and we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. There could be something else, a different strain of COVID that just proliferates. And we would need to need to know where we are so we can watch it. Because I don't, just don't know what tomorrow is going to bring with any kind of an outbreak, whether it's coronavirus or something else. And I think it's still important. It's too early to just say we're not going to have it on, on a dashboard because we don't know many unknowns. One one option I like a lot is just an option is what Children's Hospital is doing. They have the bugs watch, and COVID is only one of the many different bugs that's circulating around. And that's an option that we uh, that, that 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 we we can consider. Uh, with that, I wanted to remind us that uh, you know I'm I'm glad that COVID has uh, cases have come down and remain low, but we are still in the midst of the flu season, so it's not too late to get the flu shot if you haven't. I, I do want to mention that, you know, the bugs watch, we have a what's going around um, and we transitioned um, that report, but it's over 60 different reports that we share with the community. So at some point we'll resume that um, for, for the community. Clever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vu, for always throwing out a public health uh, prevention strategy. <laughs> We're struggling with keeping people up to date on their regular memorizations as well. People step back a, a minute and we can catch them up. So the last slide I wanted to just talk about, spurred on by Dr. Vu and lots of questions from our community members, our, our staff has put together a very comprehensive list of, of both local resources, statewide resources, and national resources for treatment and therapeutics. It's going to be available. Uh, some of the FAQs are going to be on our site. It's not going to be all of this comprehensive. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that they've discovered. Obviously, you all know that there are two types of treatments. That's monoclonal antibody therapy. As we've gone through the learning about COVID, some of the original monoclonal antibody treatments are no longer effective against the newer strains. They're developing newer ones, and those now are continuing to be available. Very important to note that even in our treatment of epilepsy or diabetes or heart disease, the treatments continue to evolve. What was true a month ago is no longer true for COVID. So it's important to recognize that we're gonna to have to continue to monitor that. 
maps, uh, we, 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 it's not highlighted. You can't click on this slide and look up the sites, but you will be able to <laughs> click on the site on our website and look up where the sites are available for monoclonal antibody treatment as well as antivirals. And I think the final thing I wanted to talk about is in, our, in the federal test to treat centers, there are sites in El Paso County where you can actually get a test and get early treatment. What does that mean? Is that if you identify somebody you've been exposed to COVID, and let's say you're in that high risk group like myself, over 65, chronic medical conditions, take care of an elderly person, if I become exposed to COVID, I can quickly go to the website if I don't have a primary care provider like Dr. Vu, I can go to the website and find where I can get tested and treated. And that's a tremendous asset in our community. So I think if we can get people that are particularly at risk, early treatment, testing and treatment, we can actually keep people out of the hospital or continue to keep people out of the hospital. And finally, I want to give a shout out to our care coordinators who have done a great job of putting this resource together and, and we'll add, update our, our website to reflect that because I do think there are lots of folks with barriers, transportation, language, lack of access to a primary care provider that we can actually assist to get antiviral treatment. And I, as you know, those are folks at greatest risk of having hospitalizations and deaths. So going forward, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think our team does a great job and I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Dr. Carabina. Any other board member questions? Questions from anyone else? And, All right, Director and, Whelan. And this information is important as we're scaling <coughs> down uh, the response and you're not going to see, you know, high volume, you know, testing sites and, um, you know, buses and, and such. It's important that we have the, the latest information available to the public and, and where they can um, continue getting, getting resources. I have... Um, Thank you, Dr. Urbina and, and, and Fadi, for the um, COVID updates and, and really good questions and, and um, engagement. I just have one um, note to end on. I, th I think I'd, I'd like to end on, on something uh, very positive always. Um, I re continually receive um, cards, um, letters um, from the public and, and different organizations um, thanking our organization for the response, and I just want to read one of them um, today. And, and this is from the um, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. I will note that our commissioner, um, Stan Vandiver, who is the chair, he's now a state uh, Board of Health member, and I think that that's um, a big benefit to uh, coordination right. and, and leadership for, for El Paso County. But here's, here's what it says. It says, we at CDPHE want you to know how much we appreciate your valuable contribution. We take this opportunity to thank you for your hard work and dedication to serving Colorado um, communities. It's been our pleasure working with you, um, CDPHE. And I just think that, I mean, this is one of many, and, and I'm reading it because I want our entire team to know that, that there's so much, um, there's so many people that, that um, support our agency and, and locals, uh, local public health. So I think that this is really nice. Okay, well, I think that brings us to the end of our agenda items. Looking around, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second? Second. All, in, all in favor? Aye. There we go. Thank you.